Hey everybody, it's Mo here at Real Relationships, Real Revenue. I have this thing where I always say, I've got a treat for you today, but I've really got a treat for you today. I'm with Josh Scott. If you don't know Josh, you don't own a guitar because if you own a guitar, you know Josh. Josh is the owner and the founder and the grand poobah of JHS Pedals, one of the largest guitar pedal companies in America and the largest independent, independent air quotes. Is that right, Josh? Yeah, we're in that top three in the U.S. It's a little hard to, there's all these definitions of what category, but yeah, yeah, we're in the top three. So here's why this matters to you, audience. I've met Josh through a masterminding group where we share deep, dark secrets about our vulnerabilities and how to grow businesses and stuff like that. And so we get to know each other really well. And by, as an aside, it's one of the, it probably is the most valuable thing I do every year. So start a mastermind group. Maybe we'll talk about that, Josh. Anyway, yeah. met Josh through that and he's built up this following of hundreds of thousands of people on YouTube. He's got all kinds of different shows and training and he does this, he does all this in such a darn interesting way. He self-taught himself. Well, I'm not going to spoil it. The, his origin story is amazing, but I think what we're going to be able to help you out with audience is even if you're a high stakes litigator. Even if you're a consultant at a tier one consulting firm, even if you're an entrepreneur, you are going to learn things in this episode about how Josh started in his basement with nothing and build up this massive organization because it's cool. So Josh, let's start. I mean, that's the promise. We're going to have to deliver on that, but I think we should start with your origin story. Like you remember being born. Why did you start there? I, yeah, the day I was (laughs) born, it was, it was a hot summer's day and Sheffield, Alabama. Now I, yeah, it's briefly, I guess my origin, like the Marvel where they take like 60 seconds and develop the character. I mean, I grew up in a very small, very small township. If you're a township is not yet a town. And so, uh, Bell Green, Alabama, which is a outside township of the city of Russellville, Alabama, which is very small, which is next to Muscle Shoals, Alabama. And if you know music, you probably heard of Muscle Shoals. Uh, There was some, you know, pretty significant Stones, Dylan, Leonard Skinner albums, Alban Brothers. There's a lot of musical history, but I grew up in this Northwest Alabama, foothills of the Appalachian kind of thing. I grew up on a horse farm. Farm is always the wrong term because like we didn't grow horses and eat them or something, but it was like, we just had horses, quarter horses, we trained them. It was like my dad's big hobby, but it was all consuming. So I grew up, you know, one mile gravel driveway, middle of nowhere. The township I'm from has a stop sign, a gas station and a K through 12 school and like 17 Baptist churches, um, within that one section of space. And so I grew up literally in this hole in the ground and both of my parents, it's worth saying, because it's been part of the story. My parents come from very large families, but very low income, poor families, single parents on both sides. You're talking seven to nine siblings. They never finished high school. They dropped out early to work. And so I come from this extremely blue collar, lower middle class environment of what is business, right? Business is like Donald Trump or something in the eighties. That's like how business felt, right? That was the perception of, I need a suit with like wing tips. I like, that's how it felt. And so I'm in that world. My dad's an amazing guy. I've learned my work ethic and a lot of my virtues are from him and my mom as well, but they were simple people with simple jobs and they did their jobs well. But I latched onto music. I just fell in love with music as a teenager and guitar became in every sense of the saying, like a drug for me. I literally, it probably did save my life where I grew up. There's like not a lot to do. And there's a lot of substance abuse issues. There's a lot of problematic things in these communities. And, uh, man, guitar, I'd come home every day and guitar was my best friend, my literal only friend. And it saved me from a lot of things. And so that took me into a musical career as a guitar player, a songwriter, bands, and which turned into playing on sessions and being the guy that someone would hire to play guitar on a short tour, whatever, you know, I'd mix that with some normal work, working in a music store. But 
Guitar was everything by the time I was 20. Found myself, long story short, a few years later, around 24 years old, late 24s. I'm 40 now, so I'm ancient, but this was, uh, you're 40, 40. Really old. you're 40, yeah. you know how it feels. So, I know how 40 feels, I think, if I remember far enough back. I accidentally started a business. So that's a loaded statement because I, in hindsight, I was always good at like coming up with ideas and selling things. Like I had these memories of like, I would like uh, sell mechanical pencils in like fifth grade and like flip a profit. Like I had a thing in me. I had like the gene or whatever. I also like basketball cards. I was like wheeling and dealing and like up, like getting rid of this one and trading this one off. There's that, that viral story that went around about the guy who traded the paperclip for a house. You might remember that. I was always thinking like that. I was always turning nothing into something and it was just fun and a game. And even music was a game. Like, could I succeed was a game. I always thought about yep. achieving and like leveling yep. it up. But when you play guitar, you have these devices. They're all behind me on the wall. This is the largest pedal collection in the world, I believe, but I'll show you a pedal. It is a, you know, it's a device. This is a Japanese pedal from the nineties, but you think these devices, they, they come in different shapes and forms, but you turn it on and it changes the sound of the guitar. The first one's invented in 1962 and it literally changes the world. That's a whole other thing that I can tell you later in another episode. If I For get your my book, book that's done. coming out, that's, yes. I'm really excited um, about getting an update on, but, but keep going. Cause there's a yeah. moment, there's a moment in the there's, story yeah. that changes everything. Yeah. There is a moment, a divine, whatever, you know, ray of light from the above. I couldn't afford to fix my guitar pedal. And, you know, as a guitar player, you have. Uh, you basically, in every sense, have a, like a piece of wood, a board, there's aluminum ones, and you kind of Velcro your little chain, you know, and you, you have a pedal board. And uh, I had certain pedals I liked, and one of them, the foot switch, broke. Can't fix it. It'd be nice to still have it, you know. And I took it apart and fixed it. And I just went into the black hole, which I had always done, you know, at one point in my life, it was horses and then basketball. Cause I'm six, five. So, you know, every elevator I'm ever in, you play ball, you know, that whole thing. So yeah. yes, I played ball and I was always like very obsessive. Um, I yeah. am still, I am an obsessive personality. And so when I fixed that pedal, that electronic actuator. Man, I went into a happy place. I was like, this is so interesting. And then I started taking them apart and teaching myself how they work. Library books, the beginnings of more searchable internet databases of things. You know, it was like 2007. The internet's there, but it's still pretty weak. Today, it's insane. Like, there was no YouTube then. There was there were some of the things we have now that don't exist, but. I got in full steam ahead. I started modifying them. So, you know, you buy a pedal, you go to Guitar Center or somewhere, you buy like a, a boss pedal or something. I would mod them just like someone might buy a car and like pimp it out or something. I was like playing with yep. changing sound. And I have, and I still, you know, I have this mixture of like purposeful ignorance. Like I am a self-taught engineer, but I also stand away from it because I've always used my ears. And even early on, I was adjusting sound and creating sounds. And I started a business. And the next thing I know, by 2011, I have three, four employees in my basement. 2012, I had a Main Street, little small, like a uh, storefront thing I converted into a, gu a guitar thing. And now here I am 15 years later, I just, the employee count was upwards of 40 and, you know, it's a full on crazy thing that I literally in every sense of the way accidentally started and have never felt equipped to do it necessarily. And I think that's the good thing. This is beautiful because so many parallels are between that story and what you've built and our audience. I mean, you are the audience because you have cool. heard me brawn about how much I care about them and love the impact. I but like I was working with some high stakes uh, transactional lawyers this morning and having a blast with them. Love work with them. I've worked with their firm for 15 years. And like a lot of people might think without hearing this interview, like, 
how could a guy who taught himself how to make guitar pedals in his basement and started this huge company, what does that have to do with high stakes transaction lawyers or consultants or an account manager, a big healthcare company or something like that? Everything is the answer. What Josh has done is had an expertise, the sound of a guitar pedal and having some really unique pedals. And by the way, audience, JHS pedals is at the higher end of things. So he, he sells his pedals at sort of at the higher end, much more expensive than others. But you yes. found a way to get the word out to build allegiance, passion about your products. And the way that you've done it is so interesting. Let's put a headline on this. And you said this to me once on a walk and it just struck me like a lightning bolt. Media is marketing. Is that what you said? Yeah. Yeah. Media is marketing. And that made me think. So now can you sort of double click on the way that you've used media, teaching, shows, just the way that you go about marketing and then getting people to love your product, to learn about your products? Yeah. It's so interesting. And an audience, listen to this because I think the idea of training at scale at getting people's attention of having media out there that, that are pulling people towards you. I think it's probably the number one thing professionals are not doing that they could do. And we can learn a lot from the best in the business. And that's Josh. So Josh, go. Yeah. Uh, no pressure with that kind of introduction. <laughs> I can tell you how I landed where I am first in my industry, which is guitar. So the guitar industry is part of the MI musical instrument instrument industry. It's a big industry. It's, it's a billions and billions of dollars. There has been a consensus of certain ways you should do it. And I think this parallels with any type of business. So for the longest time, since 1900, we have production of guitars by mass companies sold in catalogs like Sears and Roebuck all the way to the eighties when things are almost like Saturday morning toys and cars. They're very commercial and vibrant. You have all these different eras, but there's been a common thread which says you do print ads and you do trade shows and it looks like this. And if you don't do this, you're not in the club and it'll never work. And so immediately when I came in, none of that set right with me. And what I immediately caught on to was I was paying five to $10,000 for a full page ad, the guitar magazine that was setting in someone's bathroom. And that really like bothered me. So I think there's this moment that we're living in, in 2023, especially 2023. I believe it started around when I started, but I'm a student of history. I obsess over my industry and how it has worked and what are the lessons as a historian of all this, like there was a change that people kept delaying and it was because they were scared to try something new. Mm. And I, because I think it's really comfortable to keep paying for the print ad, so to speak. I'm not directly speaking to print ads. You might still need to do them in your industry. There's always something in your category that is dead in the coffin and you still want to do it because it's mm -hmm. comfortable. I'll give you some examples for the audience. It's like the transactional lawyer example. They're probably paying for a client's golf tournament still. They're sponsoring an event where there's a little placard outside of lunch that has their name on it. None of that stuff does a thing. It's the print ad, yeah, if you will. Because while you're doing that, what does it cost to sponsor a golf tournament? Oh, gosh, it could be 5000 to 50000 Like, it's real yeah. money. Yeah. So while you're doing that, there's some other person in your category on a free social platform being themselves and being vulnerable, yep. letting people in on their secrets for free, and they're murdering your business. Yep. For free. Exactly. Like, totally for free. So yeah. let's talk about what you've done. I didn't, actually didn't know this. You started in actually doing what others do and do the ads, but you're like, this oh, yeah. isn't working. But so I, I was told I had to, I was told you yeah. got to do the print ads. Here's what bothered me. I'm a data person. I'm a researcher. I could not show the proof of the result that yeah. writing that check was driving me insane because I don't look at magazines. I mean, I, yeah. I'm not everybody, but I was putting two and two together. And so yeah. one day I walked in and basically I said to a, another employee, a creative guy, younger than me. That's another key thing. A younger person is always helpful as we get older. Yep. I said, Hey, you're no longer doing this mechanical production job. You're going to start making videos. We're going to make commercials. We're going to make stupid teaser commercials for pedals because no one's ever done it. And we just need to try stuff. And so 
you know, out of the core themes of JHS on the wall, one of them is just try stuff. And that's part of this is you, ha we just constantly try things to see what people want, because the assumptions I think are the most destructive thing you can do in marketing is to assume the magazine is right and keep writing that check or yep. whatever. So we just started trying stuff. I mean, we tried everything from stop motion video commercials to we rented a bear. We rented a bunch of other animals. I uh, flew a guy to Miami to feed uh, meat to a, a panther. I rented a castle. Like I'm just making this stuff up in real time. I'm like, I want to see what has never been done. And I want to be myself. That was the biggest thing is like, I don't need to be these other people that are my heroes. I need to be me because yes. that what I can sustain my career with. If I try to be Mo, I will hate myself and like you would definitely hear yourself. Everybody would. But if I, but if I'm me, like if I can come into this business and release a product and market a product and teach about history the way that I want to, I can be myself at work when I lay down my head on the pillow, when I'm with my kids on the weekend. And I think that's a piece of this marketing thing that the, yeah. the, the unlock is that you need to quit playing the game and be who you are because there is no other substitute for you. You might be a nerd. You might be a beauty queen. You might be a skateboarder. I don't know. And I don't care. It's just like, there is no one else like you. And yep. so that was part of that approach. Yeah. That was part of the approach was we're going to try everything and I'm going to find a way to do this that's sustainable and makes me happy. And yep. so that's how we stumbled face forward into YouTube when we did. I want to keep drawing it back to the audience. So one of the things that I've been super impressed about Josh is you almost have like two versions of yourself. One version is running this organization and your CEO and you're expanding and like you've just been just having such a such success. The other version of Josh's self, which he's about to get into, but I want to make it really clear to the audience is he has become the world's leading and most renowned historian on electrical instruments. Is that what you would say? Or yeah, like, like amplification effect, of guitars? Like guitar effects and like that history of how the yep. guitar, all of it, all the sounds and all these things. Yeah, I just stumbled into it out of passion. Yeah. Well, and tying that back to, to mm -hmm. being yourself so you can sustain yourself, I really like that. Then because you're out there and you're about to talk about your YouTube following and I want you to talk about how it's grown and like it's insane, the platform you built. But because you're out there, and this is the important thing, audience, adding value, what Josh is about to tell you is it's not all commercials. It's like, it's reviews, it's history, it's, it's all these ways of adding value that if you love electric guitars, you are watching Josh. And, and I guarantee there's people in our audience that are big guitar players are like, I can't believe that guy's on Moe's show. Like, yeah, I watch him over here and now Moe's talking. This doesn't make sense. Yeah. But it does make sense because... Josh has all this value. And then because media is marketing, because he, if you will, attention is the asset. I think that's another headline we could use, Josh. Because attention is the asset, then he's able to build goodwill, build allegiance, build passion for his product. People want to support him because they learn so much and love his channel. So it's just really interesting. So Josh, now drop into YouTube, drop into what started to click and then take us from there. I think it's super interesting. Yeah. So again, we had moved out of print, all that stuff. And we decided, Hey, we're just gonna, this, this employee of mine, Nick, he's now well known. If you do watch the show, you know, Nick, I said, Hey, just start making content, make commercials, make videos, do whatever the crap you're excited to do. I believe my employees yep. need that autonomy. That's something so many people miss. If my employees are doing what I'm excited about only, they won't last. And then I have to start over. So I gave him autonomy in that department. And then the synergy of his autonomy and my autonomy, it created this really explosive thing, which led us into YouTube. He came to me and here I am, the old geezer. He goes, we were really frustrated because in my industry, you get a guitar and you like demo your gear, like a car salesman, and you put a video up and you're like, here's our new product. Sit, you know, and it's like, it's a little, it, I hate it. Like I hate everything about it. It feels like I need to have my shirt unbuttoned and like have a gold nugget, like a car salesman. And so I refused to do that. And so I told Nick, I was like, 
yeah, I hate this. I tried some demo things that were trying to get away from that. And then one day he just comes in and he goes, Hey, let's do a YouTube channel. You've been doing these like history talks and you get on Instagram mm -hmm. and talk about history. I've done some events like Ted talky things. And he's like, just can't tell us. Just like to, and I was, and I said to him, people watch YouTube. This is how stupid I am. This is 2017. And I said, people watch YouTube. Like that statement blows me away, but I immediately, again, as a learner, I was like, Hey, let's try this. Just try stuff. Like that was, I had to practice it, practice when I preach. And so we start a channel where I talk about the history of guitar pedals and all my friends' companies. And I committed to two years of never talking about myself. And it was the most beautiful experience because I never had to be a car salesman. I was literally doing it because of the love of history that I have and for my friends' products. And I've always said, hey, if my guitar pedals aren't selling, it's no one else's problem. I just need to make a better guitar pedal. I've always had that mentality. I understand the economy and things do happen, but. I've never been the victim in that world. And I refuse to be. It's like, if my product doesn't sell, I'm the one that needs to figure it out. I don't need to blame it on like, pick your politicians. You know, I just go, people just love to blame stuff. So I went in for two years and I just committed to like, tell the story of guitar for free. Cause I know a lot of secrets. I've studied this stuff for years. I'm friends with people. And man, it just exploded because people in my industry for the first or one of the first times were exposed to like someone just teaching for the love of sharing. No agenda. I didn't have to be the car salesman. And you know what? It made me so happy. I loved my job for the first time in a long time. I was sharing. Therefore, I was learning. It was like it checked every box, you know. And that really exploded. That's basically a staff of five now, the JHS show. And now I talk about my stuff and we even make fun of our stuff and we have clever ways of like disarming the awkwardness. We've, we've gotten good at that system of like, okay, the world knows I'm not just in here, like secretly peddling my product. That was important to me because I didn't want it to seem like I was playing some game where I was going to turn on everyone and bait and switch or something. I really am doing it for the sake of history, but yeah, we stumbled into that and worked really hard at it. And it's this thing where I'm inviting people. I think this is that I've tried to identify why it works. And I think it is, I've invited the world of guitar to watch me be a student and a complete nerd in front of them. I've shown like, Hey, I just love the same things you love. Come along with me and look at the process I go through. And even my new releases and products, I'll teach them how they work. I've even told people how to build one of my pedals for free. If they want to go, like, I don't care because I want to give away everything I have because that's value. This is, there's a gold. It's not a nugget. It's like a vein of gold that we're going to track this whole interview because I want you to say it again. Okay. I want to give away all that I have. And how did you finish that? Because that's value. I, I have no idea. I just, I just want to give away everything <laughs> I have because, because, I mean, the because is dot, dot, dot. I mean, it's like, yeah. it's infinite. Yeah. I just want to give it all away. It does nothing but help the community and help the whole, the whole world around you. Uh, yep. Companies can be so insulated and callous. And to me, if you know how to do something, tell the world how to do it. And they're only yep. going to join your team. And I see it in my industry. Still, people still stand at a distance and like stare across the room at some of this. And they're really afraid to give away their secrets, but it's like. Man, this no. is, you know, no matter what we're doing, anyone out there could be a part of it with you. And like yeah. inviting people into that process, man, it makes me love the process more than the product by far. Cause I'm inviting yeah. people in, like, I love the process so much more than the products because that's where I get to interact with the community, with fans, with weird business podcasts from you. Like, like this would never happen. Right. Like I. And I, and I get to learn from you. 
you, yeah. you're not a pedal maker, but man, we stood on a deck somewhere and like, I learned so many mo facts that I would have never found if I wasn't giving myself away. So there's this infinite Lion King circle of life thing. Yeah. When the company's just setting to itself and paying for print ads and playing the game that's always been played, it's a miser. In my opinion, it's the most miserable existence. Yep. So I, yeah. I want to double click on something, tie it back to the audience. One thing that's really a common thread through everybody who watches the show is every single person. And I, it, all you listeners barreling down the highway, watching on YouTube, watching on wherever, you have some deep expertise or you wouldn't be watching the show. Mm -hmm. Like everybody's got a deep expertise. And what I think's neat about ap applying what you talked about, Josh, to everybody else is one, give away everything you can given the time you've got. You got half an hour, somebody for copy, copy, you give them, you tell them, teach as much as you can. You're starting up a YouTube channel, a podcast, you give as much as away as you can. And so many people hold back. They're like, well, no, I, you know, I should get paid for X, Y, or Z. That, no, that doesn't work because the people can't get the experience of you. They can't, they can hear about what you do. You want to show them what you do. It's a big, it's a big switch. And where yours is obviously a history of guitars and amplification and elect, like sound and all these other things by somebody learning from you, they're becoming more bonded to you. They want to support JHS pedals. They want to hear about that new release that you're hitting about, you know, next month, whatever it is. And whether somebody's a, an IP lawyer, maybe you're really excited about the history of pharmaceutical device patents. I don't know. I'm making things up. Interested in the history of transactional law or you're a tier one consultant. You're really excited about how AI is going to be a part of the future or quantum computing or whatever. Start a show about whatever the heck you're passionate about. Of course, you want it roughly aligned with your business, but just start to build an audience and then I, I'll, and I'll just say one more thing, Josh, and give it back to you, because I, I want you to share some of your numbers and stats and downloads and views and minutes and whatever. But our friend, mutual friend, Tim Grawl, talks about how you make money. You can either make money by selling a few people something really expensive or a whole lot of people something less expensive. Most of our audience is the fewer people, more expensive stuff. They don't need that many clients. So as Josh shares his audience stats, which are unbelievable, Realize if you have one one thousandth of that, most of you on the show, like that's the really good thing because you don't need to have a huge audience. So anyway, Josh, talk about how this thing's grown, how many impressions you get. If attention's the asset, you're getting a lot of attention. Give us some numbers. There's a principle to this that I think is really valuable. And it is the, some of you may be familiar with this. It's the depth versus width thing with Ooh, following. Go. So. So the entire world, uh, this is where I turn into a crotchety old man at 40, but it's like the whole world is obsessed with width. Like I need 50 billion followers so I can dominate the earth. So the problem with that, here's the problem with that. A lot of followers aren't worth anything if they're not actually following. So you have to define following. Following should mean connected, engaged, common ground, buy-in, yep. philosophy of the same Word of sort. mouth. Like, yeah, yeah. there's a million followers can be as sucky as a hundred. A hundred could be way more, could be amazing, honestly. If you have a hundred followers that are like buying a, you know, a billion dollar pro, I, you know what I'm saying? It's like depth. Yep. We want depth. And so yep. the thing that I've really tried to hold focus on is... It can be very tempting to, I will share numbers. I didn't have it all together. I can tell you some yeah. stuff generally. It's so tempting in the content age. I call it, you know, the TikTok age, all this stuff. It's so tempting to chase an amount of likes or numbers. And the thing that this really hurts with this audience, what you're trying to say to people is go do this stuff. Well, they're going to go start a YouTube channel and they're going to get 45 likes on a thing and quit. Now, this is yep. the problem. That 45 yep. likes is way more than you had in these other situations you've been wasting your time. It's the depth of who are those 45? Who are the 100? Who are the 200? Who are the 500? Who are the 1,000? You might have a million followers. They could be almost all bots for all you know. It doesn't matter. It's like, do you have engagement? 
Do you have people that are like holding on to what you're about? Because that is what changes, that literally changes the world. Like it changes your world, it changes their world, it changes the world around your industry inside and out. And so I would just say, be really careful as an older person, you know, like me, 40, if you're ancient, be really careful to not chase the likes and the subscribers. You need to give away everything you know in a way that you like and do it for a period of time that gives it a chance. Too many people stop too early. Too many people are looking at numbers. So that's just a huge encouragement because I've seen some of the most brilliant things start and then they don't see, you know, Selena Gomez numbers in like 30 days and they quit. And I just want to be like, what are you doing, man? You're not Selena Gomez. You're not Justin Bieber. You're not going to have 20 million Instagram followers. You don't need them, right? Like, yeah. You don't need them. Yeah, I totally agree. And and of course, I'm going to ask you again for numbers just because I, I do. They are countable and I want people to understand the success yeah, you've had. But that said, everything you said is right on. And like I'm thinking of different clients of ours. So like, let's say somebody's um, got a really specific uh, agency work that they do at, at Omnicom or something, or they're a deep technical expert in law, like for, they, they file IP patents in a very, very specific um, industry or realm. Gosh, they might only need 50 or a hundred people that are really caring about what they're sharing because their projects are, you know, that patent attorney might crank out $20,000 $20, patents. Well, they don't need that many in a year. Um, or if they're in litigation, you just need one or two really great relationships to make your whole career. I mean, it starts with one. Like, it's that thing. We all say it. It's like cheesy. It sounds like a Zig Ziglar talk or something. But it's like the one thing is all you need. If that one yeah. thing works, if that one person really, really uh, connects. Because word of mouth, there's a... There's so many books on this. I mean, there's a book called Contagious, which is, is a, it's a solid book. Uh, there's actually some better ones, but Contagious, he covers. We never buy anything really from an advertisement, really. And I actually, I kind of fought this concept for a while. And I, I started examining my life like, you know, ear pods or like these weird skinny LaCroix. I don't know. Anything I'd buy, I'm like, yeah, someone showed it to, right? I mean, it's weird. Like if you, it almost messes with all of this because you start to realize his, his argument is successful marketing is just contagious marketing. A contagious marketing is a literal viral thing in the sense of, I tell you, you tell me, I tell them. And then, but we get really hung up on print ads and billboards and on all, and some of that, it, there's a thing there. But that's really important. The contagious factor, if you can get, he he says the the classic, you know, if you can get people to talk about your thing at the water cooler, you have one, you are doing it right. And I think that can have a slimy feeling of like, I want to make something like uh, controversial. I actually don't, that's not what he's saying. He's saying, if you're giving enough value in your thing that people can't help, but talk about it, like. That's what's happened to me is I've given away every secret there is and to come and people are excited to finally yep. not be lied to, to not be, uh, treated like idiots, to not yep. be treated like products and they get excited and they just want to talk about cool stuff. And so that's just another yep. encouragement is, yep. are you doing something contagious? And if you're doing it the old way, the answer is no, there's, it's impossible. No one ever talks about a magazine ad. I haven't talked about yeah. a magazine ad in 30 years. Like I, yeah, you're right. It ties back to a couple of things. One is, um, add value, be helpful to commit to something for a couple of years. I loved how you said, I'm going to commit to this for two years. I think that's similar. And then the third thing you made me think of, um, something I heard Mr. Beast talked about and folks don't know Mr. Beast, number one YouTuber in the world and does the like big elaborate, basically movie level things. But he just said, it, <laughs> we don't need thing. to be anything like Mr. Beast. But he said something really interesting. He said, for him, it's easier to create one 100 million view video than 10, 10 million view videos. So focus on quality is what I took from that. Focus on adding value. Focus on the right idea and perfect execution. I thought not that, and I I go, we're getting away from numbers. I want you to share yours, obviously. But 
but we don't all have to be Mr. Beast to be successful. But yeah, the gem he dropped in that, if you're some high end professional, you're thinking, man, I'm buying into this. What can I do? Focus on like, hey, what are the top six or eight questions that I get asked from my clients when I meet them for the first time? What do I usually talk about on Zoom or at the coffee shop? How am I usually helpful for early stage people? Create some videos on those, but make them really high quality, really well thought out, really densely packed with information. There's your start. Drop one out. Then maybe you do yeah. 12 of these. You drop one out for a year. You commit to yeah. a year. You will get traction from that. So anyway, Josh, back to you. I love avoiding my numbers and talking about my, my wife it. got onto me because I, I did a talk yeah, the time. Uh, on a creative conference the other night and I had, I always have to be like, it's the car salesman thing. I'm just so, it's yeah. made me who I am, but I do understand the need. Um, so yeah, here's some basic stats. Do uh, the YouTube channel as of the accidental start in roughly 2018 is at 80 million views total. Yes. I can't even, uh. Like uh, Chiefs are in the Super Bowl, you know, it's down the road. That's like, that's a lot of Chiefs stadiums full. <laughs> like that's in it. I always have this visual where it's like overwhelming. It's, it's a, yeah. where are 70 million people? Like, I know it's some of the same people, but even if it's, yeah, the math just breaks and I go, that all happened because I just was myself and like, take it or leave it. A lot of people don't like me. That's yeah. fine. I, I just go. That's the only reason it happened. So more stats, that's roughly 11, this is the boggling one, 11 million hours people have watched me yacked about guitar pedal nerdum. 11 million hours. Wow. What does that even look like? How many hours that's are there in a decade? I, 11 million. Stack those hours, you go to the moon and back 12 times. <laughs> if, yes, that's enough hours to reach Mars. So, yeah, 2022, 17 million views, 3 million hours of watch time, 50,000 new subscribers. Here's the other funny thing with YouTube, and all, and I really do need to state, I never had a master plan of this being a marketing machine. I was near burnout and just wanted to do what I want. I wanted to teach and share and give myself away. Cause that made yeah. me happy. It, it was, it was longevity of career for me. I wanted to love guitar. I started like any lawyer, you're going to, there has to be a point where you hate law for like a month. Like you just have to hate it. You probably, what do you hate every once in a while? You know, there's a thing. And you, I was trying to remove myself for that barrier so I could still love guitar. And it yeah. just turned into this crazy thing. And I just, you know, I just want to state that it wasn't like, I didn't have this like, minions movie mastermind thing about the marketing of this that's not true yeah. and the irony is it's a total loophole black hole scenario where i get paid by youtube to market like oh i revenue didn't even think last about that well yeah they paid me a hundred grand last year in google adsense i mean if we're talking business I take that and put it back into my employees and stuff. Like I don't have a wow. yacht, you know, but I'm saying like a, a yacht in Kansas city would be fun and a yacht for 90,000 would be fun. It would be like a mobile home with a, yeah. anyway, with that flip. But the point is great. we live in a world where if you, you can give yourself away, et cetera, et cetera, and actually be paid to advertise. Yeah. The print ad is dead. Like, yeah. You can, the system is here to be broken. Yeah. Well, here's where I want to go next. Um, and none of that of includes people, Instagram and all that stuff. So there's a whole other world there. Yeah. Yeah. It's insane. Let's go back to that high-end professional account manager to healthcare company. They're a consultant or whatever. One thing that I think is really interesting, and I've, I've written a lot about this lately in our, in our newsletter, you want to create assets that grow in power over time, not shrink in power over time value over time. So the old way of growing a book of business, you're a professional, you're going to go speak at a conference. I'm an account manager at a healthcare company or salesperson. I'm going to go speak at a SHRM event or at a conference. I'm a lawyer. I'm going to go speak yeah. at some, usually a health, like healthcare, or it's usually at some kind of industry that I serve that I'm going to go that has a mixture of people like me and people that hire people like me. It's usually more of the selling people than the buying people. To get on stage, you might have to pay money. 
you might have to uh, sponsor an event to give a talk yeah. in front of the lunch or to be on the main plenary stage or whatever. What those have is a half-life that's very short. So like if somebody hasn't called you like in a week after your speech, they're probably not going to call you ever. So we call that a half-life and it's a very fast one. What digital media, YouTube, podcasts, whatever, what it does is we call it a reverse half-life. You create the thing one time and it has more power a year from now, two years from now, three years out there, because it just keeps out there and keeps building. People drop into one episode, then they like, wow, this is really good. This is super helpful because you're giving away all that you yeah. can, like we've talked about. Then they watch the next one, then they become a subscriber, then they tell somebody else. So if we can, if all you professionals watching, listening, if you can think about a reverse half-life, how can I do a thing that fits all the things Josh already talked about? So I won't repeat it because it was gold, but how can I create a thing that will actually start building in its power over time? We picked up the term somewhere, just, we call it shelf life. It's probably just the same, but that shelf life is like, we want to invest our time and energy into things that are permanent as a company. And I mean, that's across the board, how I literally build a thing on the production floor, how we ship. But in marketing, why in the world am I going to take my time to pour myself and energy into a thing that is maybe going to, yeah, like you said, you got about a week, you know, it's a, it's a refrigerated good. Like I want canned goods. I want them on the shelf in the apocalypse. I want the like nuclear sun to burn the wrapper off and you could still eat it. Like I need to make content that is eternal. And so YouTube is a perfect place. It just will not go away despite even some people wondering when I just did some collaborative content with another guitar YouTuber. That's a whole other subject collaboration. He has 2.5 million subscribers, really great dude. And he looked at me and he, he's been doing a lot longer than me in the space. And he goes, you know what? I realized the other day. And he's like, Josh, you need to realize this. He dropped a bomb. He said, the video we're making right now, there's a kid who hasn't been born. Who's going to watch it later. And I was like, wow, holy crap. But like yeah. he was saying it in the context of producing and, and thinking about this, the message, like the message yep. is so permanent. I actually need to consider what is the world like in 20 years? Like, you know, guitar will never change whatever electronics are electronics history is history but man that like sent me on a like an amazing journey in my imagination i'm now and the other day i sat down to film another history piece and i realized there's a kid who is not born who will watch this in the year 20 pick a number that's mind-blowing whereas this whole refrigerated marketing thing you got like like you said yeah. i doubt you have a week I doubt you have a week after an event. Yeah. I still do hours. Events. There's yes. value. But yep. if you're wanting to invest yourself in a thing that is long, like has longevity, man, it's thinking about it. You're making content for the world to come as well. There's such a shelf life with this stuff. Yeah. It's really important. 100%. Yeah. hundred percent. And um, like, even when we do live events, which isn't a bad idea, there's typically got to be some kind of transition to digital. So a call yeah, to action yeah. at the end says, Hey, if you want more, you might check out this particular podcast episode, something that gets them into the digital realm. And then, cause once For they sure. stay there or once they go there, they're going to stay there because we're all talking about adding so much value. So I want you to comment on one other thing. And then, then I want to move to sort of the rapid fire questions at the end. One of the things I think is truly unique about what I've learned from you, which I think is mind boggling for most of our audience, but I want you to talk people through it. You actually review your competition's products. Yeah, I love it. I love it. I just want to, I do have to continually state like, I just truly like doing it and that's why I did it. And then in hindsight, I do realize it's really funny. I get it. It's like, it's very backwards, but you can't see it, but actually we're working on a thing tomorrow or I'm doing a bunch of short form, which means this content that'll be chopped up for Instagram stories and stuff. I have a pile over here of pedals. I get every new pedal made shipped to me. Almost every company just, I'm on the list. It comes into the building. There's a whole system and a person and I go through and show every, so it's like this, again, it's, 
everyone just wants to see what I think because of my perspective of history and the market and blah, blah, blah. I show my enemies pedals and talk about how great they are. I've sold out companies' pedals. I have looked into the camera and said, this is amazing and sold out entire stocks of the company. But the thing is, it's for me, that's what it looks like for me. And that's honest. Like I want to do that because it's exciting to me. And again, if my pedals aren't selling, I am the problem, not my competitor. I'm just such a believer in that. Like they're the cop out thing of like, oh, why me? No, just make a better product. Like that's, that's where I stand. So with that is this confidence where it's like, man, that has been a fire hose of interest for me. Like on both sides, the people watching are just like early on, people thought I was literally like, I can't, they were like, why is he doing this? There's this one company. It is probably the biggest MI company in the world. It's either Yamaha, Yamaha might be, but I think I don't want to leave them unnamed for various reasons. But the CEO is a complicated man. And uh, there's a pedal line they made and they're very cheap. They're like plastic. They're kind of consumer, hang them on a pegboard. You know, they're not high end. Yep. And they always get crapped on. People talk about how crappy they are. So I had them all. And when I was like, couldn't afford nicer pedals. I used one particular and I told the story and I reviewed them. And then I put them next to what they were kind of replicating and shot them out. And I did like a Mythbusters episode on them. And they sold out like the whole world sold out. And the CEO, the complicated guy who's a bit of a terror, he thought I was messing with him on purpose. And he, I get these phone calls. This is how the industry is. Though. How dare you? You sold out. Of- well, he, his comment to his Las Vegas office, because they have world branches everywhere. He's like, why is he doing that? What does he want from me? Is he tricking me? It's like, he was so insecure. And I just went to town. I just kept like, cause to me, I was like, I love this. I have broken the system. And I just kept selling them out to the point where Sweetwater, who's the biggest in my store on earth. That's, I think that's correct. Yeah. Uh, they're a, a catalog store. The number one selling pedal all time. I went, by the way, I went there and filmed content and I did their best 500 selling pedals all time. I did it rapid fire. It was really fun. Number one was this company. I literally rocketed this one product. It's cheap, by the way. You know, it's, it's almost like a gas station price, you know, going to get a candy bar. This pedal is like 20 bucks, but it was astronomically first place. And it was so jolting to the CEO that he didn't know what to do with it. But I thrive on that now. I love this idea of like, if there's a good product out there, I definitely don't make the only good products. And if I'm telling you that, then I'm a total idiot. That means I'm unaware. That means I'm very prideful. That means I have all kinds of issues. And usually the insecure person in the room is the one who talks about themselves a lot. That's kind of, we all know this. Um, I just really love sharing what's going on in the whole of my industry because it, I learn a lot and there's this circle again, you know, I haven't got it all figured out, but there's this circle of life where like just admitting there's other great stuff out there gives so much trust in the industry. I think a lot of consumers, you know, they look at JHS and go, well, Josh is either absolutely crazy, which is an option, or he's very confident in his product, which I am. Yeah. It's one or the other. I'm either a psycho, right? Or like I'm confident because there isn't an in-between here. I'm showing the other brands. Yeah. Like I'm released. I've actually released five products for other brands, released them from my show. Wow. Like I'm either a complete lunatic or... Or I really believe in my product and the consumer is like, it's one or the other. I mean, there's no in between. Yeah. Well, they so have a lot obviously of fun with choose. That. Right. Yeah. Well, I well think some people think cool. I'm crazy, which is fine. I don't, you know, whatever. I think it's brilliant. And I think it may even made me think as you're telling stories, like sometimes our competition at Bundle Idea Group is internal. You know, somebody wanting to run their own training program and not go external. And we're always like, I was just on the phone with a CMO right before we recorded this. And 
we're restarting some work with them. She said, hey, since the last time we worked together, we've developed these internal programs. I'm like, fantastic. You know, because our system's comprehensive, we can just work together and align. And when we, maybe that means we don't cover all of our content. We can support yours and ours, use the same language so everything's better. We want the participants to feel like this is one continuous integrated program. And she's like, that's great. But I hadn't even thought about what I did in that call. It was just like an hour, hour and a half ago. But it was like, embrace everybody around you, promote them, figure out how yeah. you can make each other better. I think there's a quick point. Go back to law. I like the lawyer thing because I know nothing. I've watched like Better Call Saul, but like, I don't know anything about lawyers. I pay some good lawyers and then I walk away and go play guitar. Like, I, so there's a thing here, which is even if you're a lawyer, which if you're a lawyer watching, I have mad respect for you. I don't understand all the little pieces. I don't picture lawyers waking up thinking they're creatives, but there's an issue here. I think every business is a yeah. creative venture. Agreed. And, and we're taught, here's the, you know, there's the American, you gotta go to college and do the thing. And it were, and you need to, if you're going to be my therapist, please go to college. But there's a lot of times where like people need to realize every business venture, it's a creative task. It's a creative element. And one of the biggest, I will, I want this on my tombstone. It's that creativity is collaborative, like period. There are no lone geniuses. There are no Singular, like Edison didn't make the light bulb. Edison made the light bulb with a team of dozens of people. Like nobody made the thing. There's no apple falling on the head moment and singular genius. It's just not in the narrative of history. We love to romance that thought. Yeah. But in any venture legal, you might be a restaurant owner. You might run a cat food factory. There's one of those locally. I'm just throwing it out. You might be watching cat food factory. It's a. Uh, meow mix it's kind of local you're a creator you're creative and you might yep. need to see that business is creativity and creativity is collaborative so the more people you get around the more people you freely invite in the more people you support the more people will support you the more people will invite you in and so yep. then you have this massive ability to learn constantly and always adapt constantly because everything we get near is a brand new possibility for ourselves. There's this term that I've been obsessed with, the adjacent possible. Basically, a historian wrote about it. And it's, it's the fact that all throughout time, when you get a, a, a new adjacent to something. So like if I've never heard of LaCroix, I see LaCroix and it's, I'm adjacent to it. That's like. The adjacent opens up a new possibility. I can now think about drinking LaCroix. So this happens with business. You have every invention under the sun happens because you got adjacent to a new thing. You don't have the internet without a computer. You don't have a computer without a microprocessor. You don't have a microprocessor without a transistor. You got to get to, you got to discover each step. And we're all that way in business, but we get to the next step because of what we put ourselves next to. And so I think this is something people miss. The lone island of business is a slow, miserable, and unproductive island, in my opinion. I need to get next to Mo because Mo needs to teach me to quit talking about how I didn't go to college. And you also need to teach me, hey, your intro to your book should be that. And so, yeah. okay, I got adjacent to Mo. Mo yeah. said a thought, and now it's a new possibility that I never knew. But if I'm an island, I'm never going to grow. And so I, I, this is a huge soapbox for me, the adjacent possibility. It's the idea that you're a creative being and your business is creative and you need to be getting around creative thought, creative process. Yep. You're not just a lawyer. You're not just making cat food. You're not just fried bacon in the diner. There's a creative expression in your job or there should be for you to love it. I just think it's really important. You got to get next yeah. to new adjacent possibilities. And that comes from well, community. In coming full circle to something I hit it at when we first started, the idea of a mastermind, you know, the, the mastermind group we're a part of, we see each other a couple of times a year. And there's a common thread of folks that, um, well, first of all, there's values, people that are net givers, helpful, really striving to be better, yeah. not just at work, but at home. Like the value part is probably the first thing you got to get right. 
So only people get to enter if they have the values you want. But then the secondary part is people that are experts that are growing and in some ways doing something digitally is sort of like the rough, loose group. And for me, in doing what we do, audience already knows that, but to be able to learn from you who runs a guitar pedal company and then learn from Tim Grawl, who's a storytelling expert and scaling and teaching people how to write great fictional stories yeah. to a large extent. And then, you know, all these other people, everything from best-selling authors to online trainers to everything. Oh my gosh. Like it is, I, I, I am not exaggerating audience when I say that meeting up with this group is the most important thing I do all year. It's a reset. I get a reflect. I get a share. We've made this progress, which is always amazing to be able to, to do that and have a a yeah. big enough time interval that you get to share what you've done. But then most importantly, figure out, get people's advice, figure out what you're going to do next. And you get these different perspectives. It is easily the number one thing I do all year. And you're a big part of it. Yeah. It's the same to you. Because we're getting around the unfamiliar possibilities that we might actually be able to use. And that's what people yeah. are missing. Yeah. Lawyers hanging out with lawyers will think like lawyers. Lawyers hanging out with ballet dancers will suddenly think like, a, I'm, I'm dead serious. Like you'd be amazed what could happen if a lawyer would hang out with a ballet studio company and like, do you yep. never know it clicks? It's like, yep. we're told and we're slightly indoctrinated that you need your category. But that is like, nature doesn't work that way. You need a bee that has nothing to do with a flower to make the flower grow. Oh, but wow. we're like, Good we're one. so yeah. indoctrinated with this thing of like, Hey man, if you're going to like run a restaurant, you need to like, you need to do that. Maybe that's not what you need to do. Maybe you need to do what you've never done. So you'll do it wrong, which is actually right. Yeah. There's a lot of things to unpack in this, but I know that my entire career, you've helped me with this. You know, I would be like, it's an accident. I can't believe, well, I've worked really hard, but I know that, you know, people like you have helped me go, well, no, Josh, you know, you work really hard. You should be okay with that. Quit saying that you grew up in Alabama, you know, I have that, that problem. And you didn't go to college. But, <laughs> right. But the You're thing is. You're on the 99th percentile on economic <laughs> success. You're like, no, but I didn't go to college. I'm like, we think you're okay. <laughs> you're probably all right. You're going to make it. Yeah. <laughs> There's just the thing where it's like, we've got to see these other possibilities and community yeah. around us to make our industry or our alley become fresh, you know. Yeah. If you're tired of the legal system, you need to figure out how to break it a little, you know, whatever that looks like. If there's something itching, then look outside of the thing. Cause the answer is probably not in the thing. It's been beat. It's a dead horse. Every industry at this point, I mean, we're in 120 years of like solid industry thought. You got to start mixing it up now. I mean, we're yep. just in a, it's a mess, you know, and trying the same thing over and over is insanity. I've heard that definition. It's like, it's literally insanity. All right. Here's what we're going to do next audience could talk all day. Um, three rapid fire questions. Then we've got our crazy question at the end where I'd spin a wheel and you have to answer something, oh, really boy. Random, which is going to be fun. I know. I'm very, I'm very right. nervous. So the rapid fires and we'll, and we'll keep this sort of brief. It'll be fun to like skim across yeah. the surface a little bit. What's your personal system to keep learning? Personal system to keep learning is a book a week. I like the book, set the book aside for a month, pick the book back up, handwrite anything I highlighted, and then put that in Evernote and get around people that I don't know anything about the profession. That's my 30,000 foot view of that approach. Wow. That is freaking awesome. You know, have I showed you uh, Tiago Forte's book, Building a Second Braid? Yes. Isn't it good? It's awesome. It's, it's yeah. fantastic. Yeah, He's going to be on the show. I saw the book and through the group, I was shown the book. I read it pretty quickly. And then I watched some yeah. of his content and his, his YouTube stuff is a reflection of what we were saying. He's giving himself away. He um, is. And I'm, and we're actually, we're hiring yeah. a digital media specialist, which you actually help shape the role. The main videos I want us to model are Tiago's. Like he teaches and in five minutes on YouTube, you feel like you got an hour's worth of stuff to your point. Yeah. It's so good. I yeah. love it. That's a great book. For, and a lot of people need to read that. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then Josh and I, we have the same agent uh, as Tiago. So it was an easy intro and I'm really excited about the cool. it's work. So, so your personal system to keep learning. So everybody, if you want to go deeper on what just Josh just said, it's all outlined and building a second brain and it's the ability Literally. to 
you're using Evernote. I use Craft. It's there. It, it is. It's been the single most sort of unlocked for efficiency for me in the last five years. I would say it's an. I it's read insane. that book and felt way less weird. Like <laughs> I, I, because I always thought like you're a little crazy, and then and yeah. then I implemented yeah, it's extra. Part. It's such a good book. Yeah. Such a good book. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, so next up, you've blasted the new plateaus dozens of times. Just in your story, it was super interesting. So from your perspective, what do you think are the lies that people tell themselves that hold them back? I think the number one is that uh, it's imposter syndrome. It's like, first of all, I think it's just the truth that you need to know that no one really knows what they're like. There's, there's such a breakdown. Like, I know what I'm doing. I can run this. I've run this company. I've learned, you know what you're doing. But, but we, we each wake up every day. If you're a creative, I'm trying to wrangle this into the singular thought. If you are a creative, which you are because you're in a business and you have to create solutions and ideas and products and marketing, you have to constantly put yourself where you've never been because when you create something, you're making a non-existent thing exist. You yep. need to admit and be really comfortable with the fact that you don't know what you're doing. And that's a good thing. That's the biggest lie. I don't know what I'm doing. I can't do this. Well, no yeah. one's ever known what they're doing. Like they just have it. Yeah. Back to Edison or Tesla. They would have never, we wouldn't have light bulbs if he only did what he knew how to do. It's like the simplest yep. concept. We literally would yep. not have this zoom call or whatever. If people only did what they knew how to do. Yep. All of human history only moves when people do what they don't know how to do. So audience, we've got yeah. to challenge ourselves, stretch outside yeah. our comfort zones, try something new and it's going to fail. That's good. Oh, it's you, scary you and vulnerable stay, and stay, weird, yeah. but you know, that's life. We're made to fail. That's great. Yep. Just smile, move on. Good. Um, okay. Last set question before we spin the wheel. How do you keep yourself on track, including handling setbacks that happen? My biggest thing is I love a lot of stuff. And so I will wander through a lot of, I'll go from a book about building a second brain to, I just, I'm studying the spice trade of the 1600s. I like, what does that have to do with any, but I think that's part of the possibilities I'm learning. And so I, I have a lot of ideas. I have too many ideas. We have idea paralysis here and it's just like, it's, it's picking, and I think a lot of people struggle with this. Just pick a thing and finish it. The other things will always be there on your list. Like it is that simple. I think there are certain personalities like me who are just like, man, I would, I would immediately go join the air force tomorrow or something. You know, I'm just like, let's do anything. I just, there's a thing though. You just need to finish the thing. This is my son preaching to the choir. I need to finish my current task, my current ambition and keep a good record of my thoughts for other things and don't let it derail me. And I think Cal Newport's deep work is a great example yep. of some practicality. Yep. Get in there and finish the thing. Go back to your notes. They're not, they're not going anywhere and you'll be fine. Like, yeah, that's, that's my advice. Right on a yeah, real practical tip for everybody. One thing I started doing just in the last couple of months. I used to keep all my ideas and to do's sort of in one database. And I realized like it was feel defeating because I come up with ideas a lot faster than I can do them. And when I see them all, I'm like, oh, I only got one out of the hundred things. I only got 1% done. Well, 99 of them were like for years from now. So I started putting those in the second brain database. I'm using craft as an app. And then I only put the things that I'm like focused on in the short term. And now I actually feel like I get things done. So really good. I've okay. never heard of craft. Left. I'm looking. Yeah, it's ever notish. I like it. I think it's a little cool. more elegant. But you know, now you got cool. a new thing. Now I've been distracted. I'm going to obsess Our... over this this evening. <laughs> I love it. It has a lot of the same similarities, but I think it. Yeah. Cool. Anyway, we'll, we'll talk later. Okay. Now, right. Josh Scott, it is time oh. for the super powerful, inspirational nudge, otherwise known as spin. And now we're going to spin this wheel for a video. Watchers, you can see it spin. I just, I just had flashbacks of being in my grandma's in elementary school while she watched Wheel of Fortune during the day. <laughs> I'll take a, uh, I'll, is there an E? Uh, all right. Here's your question. 
How do you hold yourself accountable? I surround myself with people who know how to do the things I am not good at and who will tell me their honest opinion. And I built my company around that. I built my company around people with autonomy and opinions and expertise. And I have to allow all three of those things. I allow their autonomy, their opinions, and their expertise. I want them to look at me and say, Josh, that is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. And that uh, accountability is a, another key to creativity. I think there's the whole thing of the starving artist, which I don't think is a real thing. That's a whole other podcast. The starving artist is the person who just suffers alone and just can't get it done. You know, they just can't make it. Really, you need people to keep you on track. You need people to say, hey, what's this thing we're working on? This community, yeah. this collaboration. Josh, you really shouldn't be doing any math. I need to hear that, you know? I need I need Steve to look at me and go like, hey, please don't pay the, don't do the taxes ever. Like, don't even look at the the amount. Go into your little room, do your thing. I'll do this and I'll trust you, Steve. But you have a, and that's how it works. So for me, it's yep. that. Again, it's a little bit of a community. Creativity is community. It's also collaboration. And I think there's this, yep. this accountability in collaboration. It's the perfect ending. It pulls it all together. Um, the wheel knew. The wheel knew what question to yeah. ask to end this. Yep. I'll close on this with that thought. To make that work, though, you have to get rid of your insecurities. Mm -hmm. You have to let someone look at you and say you're stupid. And then you have to go, all right, I am stupid. I cannot be the superstar in that situation. I have to learn at all times. So even if you're the... The big boss, you know, I'm the big bad boss, which I'm not at all. I think my employees love their job. I have to be able to listen and go, okay, yeah, that's true. I am on, I'm up here on the moon yeah. and reality, actually, that's not going to work. You're right. So you got to be humble in that situation, but it always pays off. You just, I'm, I, I'm, I'm holding back commenting because I'm thinking of like dozens of times my team has said, no, we're not going to do that thing you just said you're going to do all the way from yeah. tactical things to strategic, but yeah. Um, you can Thank fight goodness. back a little, but it's just like, can you do it in humility? And, and if you, if your argument's a valid argument, then it's a valid argument, but you'll know pretty quick if you're just being an idiot. Yeah. yeah agreed. And it's building the team that, that does that. Okay. Let's close out. People are going to want to like know more about how they can connect with you. What's the best way to find the, the YouTube channel or other social or like how, how should people connect with Josh Scott? Every social media is at JHS Pedals. So J H S P E D A L S, J H S Pedals. Uh, Instagram's our most active, vibrant. You know, I'm on there a good bit. That's like the world to kind of see the day to day. Um, I have a personal Instagram, which is just like my hobby is photography, which is slowly not a hobby anymore, but that's at Joshua Heath Scott. So I'm actually on there. If you want a DM or something, if you have a question, I'd be glad to, that's a place to find me personally. And then if you're into this, like, if you want to watch a YouTube channel, that's the equivalent of like, you know, Nick at night or something of guitar. It's the, it just go to YouTube and type in J H S show. It, the channel is actually JHS Pedals, the, the same thing, but you'll see that there's playlists about history or products. There's hundreds of episodes and they're all over the place, but, you know, just go on and prowl around. We're on TikTok and stuff too. You know, I don't, I haven't gone there. I'm letting the younger, I'm letting the kids do that for me, you know, but we're taking that same content and batching it out. But yeah, that's, we're everywhere you would think we're at. Instagram's best for me personally. If you want to chat, you can yep. hit me up on my, at Joshua Heath Scott. That's awesome. There's a website, and then JH com, yep. and six to 700 dealers worldwide. If you're just, if you have a hankering for a guitar pedal, just, they're probably in a guitar store near you. I love it. Dude, it, this has yeah. just been so great. When we prepped for this, I just knew it was going to be super different and interesting. I think um, it was even way, way, way. Even, I had high expectations way better than I thought it would be. It's, I just knew you would deliver. So thank you. Thanks for being on the show. This has been so fun. I had a blast. All I can do is be me and tell you all the weird things I think. <laughs>